such as Shia Kundi's energy. <laughs> and still home someplace. Turned down a purple heart. And here I'm a kid, 19 years old. You don't know much. You think you know all that, but you don't. We're on this rice paddy, and the place is full of rice paddies. All over the place. And kneeling down, one knee, and the other knee is up like this. See, all of a sudden, zoom, down comes on a piece of shrapnel. Lands on my, it was just like somebody hitting me on a baseball bat on my thigh. I brushed it off real quick. And a corpsman come along. I don't know where he came from. He said, you all right? He said, you got hit. I said, I know it. I said, I don't know if I'm all right or not. I haven't tried to stand up. Well, he said, you yeah, was hit by enemy fire. You want a purple heart. I said, no, I said, give it to somebody else that deserves it. <coughs> Who's they taking it now? Because I guess you get money for them. That <laughs> 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 was that experience. And I went on with the assault. I'll never begin that particular experience shortly after that. We had a flamethrower with us. Boy, you ought to see something. When them flame guys got two cylinders on his back with a flamethrower. You ought to see the fire that them flamethrowers throw. Wow. <coughs> First I ever see one. We're getting close to Naha. Naha was the city of the capital city of Okinawa. It was about as flat as this table when we were there. <coughs> I talked to people sent to this building. But we're on a rice paddy and we're looking Naha. The rice paddy down below us, kind of like this. And we're up here. Rice paddy. All of a sudden flare goes up, way off in the distance someplace. Zoom. Lift the whole place up, just like day. And I look, there's nine Japanese soldiers. When the flare went up, they all dropped to one knee. They were probably, oh, 35, 50 feet in front of me, kind of up on the one side a little bit. All dropped in one day, all, all in something. <coughs> well, I was carrying a BAR at the time. <laughs> Put a new clip in, a couple more. Then the flare went out. And all of a sudden, you know what a very pistol is? Yeah. Years ago, years before communicated on boats and carried a very pistol while well, you're out on the lake or in the ocean or someplace else and you hear some other sound someplace, you shoot your very pistol up, it's like a 12 gauge shotgun shell, only it's got a flare in it, red flare. You shoot it off, don't let the other guy know where you're at in your boat. Well, the first guy in this line had a very pistol. Way over the top of my head. Six inches, eight inches of foot, I don't know. But I can see this thing today. Coming right out, right away. Give him a little more. That was it. I was going to bring the very pistol home, but one of my bullets went through the stock of the very pistol, through the pistol grip, went right through the pistol grip, and the thing was all shattered, and I said, so I'm going to go take an apple. So I left it there. With 
that way, I guess that kind of wound up the operation. We had pretty well occupied Okinawa at that point in time. <coughs> got that board ship, and I got Yellow Jaunas. You know what Yellow Jaunas is? Your feces are about the size of deer turds. <laughs> Your urine is like coffee, and you turn about as yellow as that piece of paper. Yellow jaundice. We got back in the bottle canal, and boy, all they gave us was ice cream. <laughs> boy, six times a day, we got ice cream. Oh, huh. And the doctor told me, and I had never, he said, Billy, he said, don't ever give blood. He said, you'll carry that virus for the rest of your life. And I guess I got yellow jaundice virus. In me yet, I don't know. But anyhow, I came back to the mainland, went up to Klamath Falls, and was discharged. At that, I was cleared of the jaundice. <coughs> I was discharged from the military. So that's the essence of my experience overseas. I'd go back in the Marine Corps in a minute if I had to. They won't take me anymore because I can hardly walk. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you. We've heard from Mr. Kyle about one of the most famous people that he served with, Joseph Kennedy. Who's the well-known Marine that you served with? Oh, Chesty Fuller. Oh, okay. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Chesty Fuller. Oh, yeah. He was a short man, he wasn't a tall man, but he had a barrel chest. They called him Chesty, but he was a colonel in the Marine Corps. We were on Guadalcanal. He said, hey, you come on over here. I went over. Yeah, I helped him chop down one of the one of the uh, palm trees. And we used the palm tree, they set up a theater out there and he used the logs from the palm tree to sit on to watch the movie theater. Chesty Fuller, I, I worked with him for, well, I don't know, 8, 10, 15 minutes. I don't know how long it took to cut this dizzy tree down. They cut easy. They're kind of grainy wood. They cut kind of easy. Chesty Fuller, then somebody called him and he left. And that was that. My experience with Chesty Fuller. Any other questions? I'd like, <clears throat> I'd like to know where both you guys were. Exactly when the war ended. Well, it came out. <laughs> and? London. In London. Yeah. But it took a day or two before you realized what happened, and that then, or was a reserved celebration, or was immediate, or rumors? We, did you believe it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> we were on Guadalcanal when they had D Day. Well, what's D Day? We, could, we had no idea of the battle in Europe. We weren't physically involved in it. We had no communication. You didn't have radio, the pocket radio. You had nothing like this. It would come word of mouth or whatever it was. And you were in London. Yeah, I was in London. The the and the rumor was going through the country that I went through the troops uh, several days ahead of time. So people had gathered massively in London, and all the people in, in England had gathered to come to London. There were dances in the streets and the street dances for the two blocks long. Anybody that could play any kind of a little squeeze box or a high leg or anything that made music. Along the streets, taxis and buses were all stopped. They couldn't, they couldn't move because of all the people. And the subways, the underground, as they call it, were still running. But, uh, the people were just so happy, and everybody singing, and just uh, never, saw a, never saw such a big crowd. Then coming by Buckingham Palace, I didn't get to Buckingham Palace. Back, but, People and the English people have a great respect for the king and the queen, and at emotional times, 
together and try to put them in palace and periodically the a member of the family, the royal family, will come out and give the royal wedding. Sometimes you have two or three, and sometimes the whole family. But, uh, and the, the royal family stayed right in Buckingham in Palace right through the war as a part of the contribution of the morale of the place. And uh, also, what was a kind of a, an unspoken uh, respect on the two sides. The, the Germans did not intentionally bomb Buckingham Palace or the St. James Cathedral. They did respect the cathedral one corner at one time, accidentally, and they followed that. And, uh, it was a great excitement and great relief for everybody. Your question, sir? Uh, yeah. You're talking about the end of the war. I kind of want to know what the atmosphere was in North Tonawanda before you guys went 19 years old and you got in. And how about all the guys? Did you know the guys that went over and they came back and you got like Sil Dan and Pat DePaulo and Jimmy Amato. Charlie Pacini. Did you ever hear of Charlie Pacini? Yeah. yeah I knew Charlie Pacini. He was in the Marine Corps. He was a good football player. He really was. Well, but did you know himself. those guys <laughs> when you were 19? He had a carbine. What was your attitude of Charlie of shot guys? himself right between the toes. <laughs> his toes are like this. The boy was an accident, but right, so right between his toes, he went over the sick bay and they put a band-aid on either toe, and that was the end of that. Did you guys, <laughs> well. did you guys want to go over and, and eat them guys up alive? You just, you were itching to go. What was the attitude of uh, North Taiwanda kids? A lot of North Taiwanda kids went, and then my, my brother, my older brother, he didn't even get him a graduate out of high school. He, he, he didn't make graduation service. Over and jumped eight times behind enemy lines. His paratroopers. How was the attitude of those guys? Uh, Sil Dan told us a story about... Sil Dan, I knew him too. He, uh, he was in the cockpit. They got shot down. He had to jump out of the plane. He was in the gunners because he was a little guy. He jumped out. He was supposed to count to ten before he pulled up. Or he says, I went one, two, three. He pulled up. <laughs> I says, how did the Germans treat you when you landed? He said, oh, they loved us. They welcomed us with open arms. Come on. I mean, he was all kidding about it. What was the attitude of North Tonawanda guys? There was a ton of them. There was a war. We had Pearl Harbor, and the president put all the Japanese in, what do they call them, internment camps? So the feeling at that time against the Japanese was intense because of the act of Pearl Harbor. And I can understand at that time well, he put, and, the Jap and I guess the Japanese are like anything, anybody else, the English or the Polish or the Chinese or the Germans, we're all kind of clannish in our own right, be us what we may, where were we, and the Orientals in particular are a little more clannish than the rest of us, and I can understand at that time why Roosevelt with these Japanese people in internment camps for fear of their committing more acts of violence, spying, or be it what it may, in the United States. I think he did the right thing at the time. And subsequently, I spent a lot of time in Honolulu. Subsequently, one of the senators from Honolulu passed a law or a rule that these Orientals, the Chinese, be or Japanese, be reimbursed for their time in these internment camps. It goes back quite a few years, but it, I forgot the guy's name, the senator, for the reason it doesn't matter. Any but other I, questions? I, I'm sorry. I have one for Bill. Um, 
I read a story a few months ago about a soldier named Desmond Doss who served in the Battle of Hacksaw Ridge. Um, did you ever meet him or any of the soldiers that took place during that battle? Mm -hmm. And you didn't get to know too many guys who would be shifted around. I had one fella that I got to know pretty well. His name was Bob Farr, F-A-R-R. -R. He was from Everett, Washington. But he was a bum. <laughs> By this I mean a young man like myself, but he rode the rails. He traveled around the country on the rails, on the railroads. We call him a bum. Actually, he knew a hell of a lot more than I knew about how to live. Bob <laughs> Farr. And he worked in the mess hall so he wouldn't have to go on guard duty. <laughs> so along come the horse. Bob <laughs> Farr's got big cans of oatmeal. They, they, the mess hall, they had cans of probably three foot square for the troops filled with oatmeal in the morning. Well, Bob Farr would get the cans of oatmeal and Take him over and give him the horse and eat him. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any other questions? Yes, sir. I just have a comment. Uh, thank you both for this. Uh, it means so much for, to all of us from North Tonawanda. Uh, my dad, all his brothers, all my uncles from my mom's side fought, but didn't want to talk about it. And I understand that. Um, <clears throat> you both are so impressive, not only for your hearts, but your minds are so clear, and the remembrance you have is just amazing. And uh, thank you. Thank you both.